All right. For today's critical thought, we're going to return to the topic of emergent game design. But more specifically, we're going to talk about if we can determine any crucial elements or major points that need to be there in order for emergent design to form. Now, if you aren't aware of the term, emergent game design is one of those holy grail grand master concepts for game development. And something that many games have boasted that they are, or they do have it, but only a handful actually make that cut. Now, you'll know what the term is. Immersion game design refers to this concept that the mechanics or systems of a game have so much utility or so much adaptability that expert players can figure out ways of combining mechanics to create either new forms of gameplay or even just new forms of design within that game space. And that's why a lot of people want their games to be considered emergent design and why it's kind of become a major buzzword over the years, especially for sandbox style games such as Minecraft, Factorio, and there are probably a lot more that I'm forgetting right now. But, as I said a few minutes ago, despite so many games claiming to have emergent design, I think there's only, or there's a few set conditions in my opinion, that have to be present in order for this to work. So the first one is, and this is going to be very tricky to explain, a widely defined set of mechanics. Now, mechanics, as we know, are the elements or the or means of interaction when it comes to playing a video game. Running, jumping, shooting, portal gun, managing taxes, building cities, and we could spend the next probably 20-30 minutes just listing more and more mechanics. But, when it comes to most video games, mechanics have a very rigid definition in terms of what they do. For instance, in most RPGs or fantasy games, if I have a fireball spell that lets me hurl fire at you, it only works for damage. And in a way, when we talk about mechanics that are so rigidly defined, this also brings up the issues of ludo-mechanical and ludo-narrative dissonance. On one hand, you say I'm an all-powerful wizard who can create death beams with, with a flick of my hands, but I still need a key to open up a wooden door. When we talk about this idea of widely set mechanics, what we mean is that the components or the options in game have fluidity or adaptability to how they are used and how the world responds around them. And I know that can be very tricky to talk about, but when this works, it allows for a mechanic to have purpose and utility beyond just a basic function. And I'm going to give you a test right now. I want to describe three spells in a video game. And I want you to think of as many creative ways to use these spells in tandem with each other. And one of them I came up with that combines all three. So I'm curious if, for those of you watching, if you can come up with better examples or even come up with the same one that I came up with. So the first spell is uh, Fire Creation. I hold out my hand and I can generate flames probably on par with a bonfire. Second one is Iron Skin. I cast a spell and my skin gains the density and properties of steel, or I'm sorry, of iron, but I can still move around. And then the third is a Concussion Force. I push out like a wave of energy that whatever it hits will send it flying in the opposite direction. So given those three skills, can you think of ways to combine them beyond just simple damage or defense? And again, I thought of a way of doing it for all three. Now, with that said though, when you're defining mechanics like this, it's more about defining a set of properties along with them, and then how they apply to the world around them. So, as another example, let's say I'm building a, or let's say I'm making a game that's about building vehicles or crafting all manner of crazy inventions. And let's say there's an item called Icarus Wings. Whatever I put the, these wings on, it gains the property of flight. So this would be an example of kind of creating the foundation for merchant design. Because again, the Icarus Wings by themselves 
have a very set definition. But the actual application in the world is very fast. And I guess as another example of this, I came up with this idea a long time ago for this survival base uh, squad kind of like third person shooter title. This was way a very long time ago. And in the game, I drew up the concept of how destructibility works in this world. So what I did was, every item or every piece of environment in the world is organized in a scale of 0 to 10. 0 being like paper thin, 10 being indestructible. And what happened, or how I set this up, was every weapon in the game, from fists to bombs to machine guns, whatever, has a respective damage property. So if the weapon's property is equal to or greater than the defensive value of any environmental object in the world, it can be destroyed by it. So a normal handgun, if I'm shooting like a wall, is not going to do much. If I have like a heavy assault rifle or a minigun, then yes, I can shoot through that wall and probably hit anything on the other side. If I put a bomb down on the second floor of a building, I can, you know, blow up in the floor and have it the uh, crumbling or the rubble fall on enemies below. But again, the idea is everything is very set in its definition. But because of utility that's present, it allows for these emergent situations to happen. Now, the second condition, I think this is one that it could, I think, cause some trouble, is that there has to be, or there should, this should probably cause some arguments in the comments, there has to be an end game. There has to be a goal, either defined by the game or defined by the player, in order for emergent game design to happen. As I said earlier, a lot of open-ended or sandbox titles claim to feature emergent design, but Without having something to shoot for, I don't really consider it emergent. For instance, if all I'm doing is literally placing blocks down in an empty space and nothing else happens, that's not really emergent gameplay. Yes, I am creating something, but it's not something unique or it's not growing what's there. Now, let's say, for instance, that I want to set up wind power in this town. So, I have a building that has a windmill on it, it spins, let's say I use a rope that has the property of, of course, attaching itself to two different points, wrap it around the base of the windmill, put it to like a crank or to some kind of gear, have that turn around, and then that generates energy. So in this case, I'm taking multiple elements, each with their own set properties, with the purpose of creating the goal of wind energy. For instance, one of the things that I saw with Minecraft, or with the later versions, was the ability of setting up like electrical currents, or tracks, and pathing. Now again, by themselves, these elements are optional, and maybe for a lot of people they didn't use it. But for those who could really delve into it, you could create some very elaborate systems and settlements with it. Now, another major part about this, and this is where things get very tricky, is also having a very wide middle. As in, here's my star pointer, this is what I have. This is what I'm aiming for. But everything to get to, those, get to between those two points is completely up to interpretation and strategy. So what this means is a linear game where I am going from beginning to middle to end, you know, force combat sections completely you know, go from point A to Z and you win the game, is not an example of emergent design. But a game that allows me multiple avenues or multiple solutions to a single or multiple problem does open itself up to emergent gameplay. Uh, to give you another example from something that I was thinking about, one of my grand ideas, like one of my dream concepts, was for a... I'm not even sure how I would describe this game. It's kind of like an uh, economy game meets Grand Theft Auto in a fantasy setting. The idea is you want to take over the land from these various lords and ladies who have kicked you off your own property. So the goal of each area is basically take control of the castle or the keep 
or just the land itself. But how you do that is completely up to you. You could figure out what the Lord is trying to profit from and ruin that. You could try and buy them out. You could even try to negotiate with them and try to take them under, basically put them under you, or you just buy them out from underneath them like that. But the point is, I have an end goal to achieve, but everything to get there is completely up to interpretation. A really good example of this kind of thought process is from Zaktronic's puzzle games from Space Chem, Infinifactory, TIS, and so on. Each game, once again, the puzzles are defined by having a set beginning, I know what parts I have access to, there's an end, I need to build X, or I need to create X amount of resources, or anything like that. But how I combine everything, and how I solve that, is completely up to interpretation. And that's a major point of those games, thanks to the histograms, and being able to see how people, or how other people using the same items that you have, can have vastly different solutions. And this is definitely where emergent design comes into play. Another great example I mentioned earlier was something like Factorio. Factorio, again, is a game that hits all the major points. I have very set mechanics or items in the world, but their application is very wide. I have complete freedom in terms of what I can build, but I also have end goals I can go after. So the, for instance, one of the very first things you can do is set up a perpetual uh, steam-driven power supply for your entire base. This involves combining mine carts and auto drillers and loaders to basically use a steam generator to power the drilling of the coal. So then the coal gets then transfer or transported to the generator, gets fed into it. So the machine is basically powering itself along with the rest of your settlement. And again, that, the game does not reference these options. It doesn't tell you to do this, but it simply leaves the building blocks out there and leaves it up to you to figure out how do I combine A, B, and C to perform this task. Now, with that said though, I am curious again, for those of you watching this, besides the tests I mentioned earlier, can you think of other great examples of emergent game design? One that I know a lot of you are going to mention that I didn't cover is of course Dwarf Fortress. And how that game again is built around just a whole lot of options and then it's just about seeing how they interact with each other and what events or cause and effects happen in response to it. But let me know what else you think as well as to that test I mentioned earlier. But thank you so much for watching today's Critical Thought. If you're new, be sure to like and subscribe. And let me know if you have any ideas for future vlog topics. And if you'd like to hang out in our private Discord channel and talk design, check out patreon.com slash gwbicer for ways of getting access as well as VIP status and more. So that's it for today. Have a great rest of the day, and I'll talk to you all next time. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Check back around 10 Eastern for regular streaming. If you'd like to suggest games for me to cover or topics to talk about, let me know in the comments below. For a collection of my writings, as well as weekly podcasts on design, check out Game-Wisdom.com. To support the Game Wisdom Patreon, you can find us on there on Patreon.com slash GWBicer. A dollar will get you into our private Discord channel where we talk game topics and more. Five dollars will get you voting privileges for any major event, including the Saturday Night Grab Bag, Patreon-funded goals, and more. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you enjoy more videos here on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel.